Last time, when we were discussing, we were discussing about chapter 11, the, the incidents of Babel. And now we're going to continue on from where we left, left off. We're going to read from chapter 11, verse 27 and on. <clears throat> this is the account of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father, Terah, was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chardians in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, and the father of both Milcah and uh, Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no children. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, and his wife of his son Abram. Together they set out from Ur of the Char uh, Chardian to the Canaan. But when they became, uh, when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived the two hundred five years, and he died in Haran. So it just uh, shows the account of Terah and his family, which is the family of Abraham. There are a couple of things that we need to kind of um, understand from here. So when you look at the verse 26, after Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. So when you read verse 26, um, it sounds like, Terah had a triplet. It's like when he was at 70 years old and he had Abraham, Nahor, and Haran at the same time. But that's not true. Um, so when you look at it, Abraham's name comes first and Nahor second and Haran's next. So it seems like Abraham is the, the oldest one and uh, the Haran is the youngest one. But that's not true. So when you read the Bible, you have to be a little careful when you see something like this. It's not always by the order of their age. This happened, same thing, when we we're reading the, um, the Noah's son, remember? Noah also had a three sons. And the story goes very similar. So when you look at um, chapter f uh, 5, I mean, 6, actually 5, verse 32. After Noah was a 500 years old, he became the father of Hashem, Ham, and Japheth. Same thing, right? So it's not a triplet it is referring to. There are just like when Terah uh, became in 70, and he started to have his sons. So, and the reason that Abraham and Nahor and Haran, that order comes in, not as age, but the order of important. So don't get confused with that. So, so he had three sons, Abram and Nahor and Haran. So Haran died at, um, when they were at Ur. And he came out of Ur of Chardians with Abram, Nahor, and other sons and daughters, and their grandsons and daughters. So they came out of that land. So we're going to take a look at uh, uh, where the Ur, the uh, Char uh, Chardian is. Uh, let me see if I can find this map. Okay, so I'm going to have the screen share. Let me know when you see the screen. Okay, so it's not a really high resolution, uh, but at least you can see briefly here. So 
this is the uh, the map all right so this side on the lower left side left uh, this is Egypt and this is Mount Sinai uh, and Sinai Peninsula and this is where the the, the land of Canaan and then this area where you see I don't know if you can see clearly it's a there's Ur this is where they actually left so the Ur uh, is where they left and this is where God called them out and they settle at Haran which is up here up north but when you look at it carefully um, it, you may not actually see it here but when you look they followed the uh, the trails of the Euphrates River you see this I don't know if you can see this so the reason that they followed this the, the Euphrates River is because this is where they can find food right so if you if they go over here this is wilderness they, they can't they can't find any food here so rather than go over here they just followed up north so they moved from Ur to to Haran so where did God direct them to go did God actually direct them to go to Haran or did did God direct them to, to go to uh, the Canaan yeah God told them to go to Canaan not to Haran but as we talked about it several times in the past that the directions I mentioned is important, right? This, the Uru, is on which side? And, and this is the eastbound. This is the eastbound, right? And the promised land, which is where God is direct them to go, is westward. So they were coming from the eastward to the westward, right? So. But God told them to go to Canaan, but instead of they go over here this way, which might be very, you know, much faster to go from here to here straight, but rather than go to the Canaan, they took the safer path, which is up north following the Euphrates River. Uh, okay. One second, just all right. Yes, so we're looking at the the map right now. Uh, so I'm explaining about uh, how God called uh, Abraham out from the Uru and trying to bring him to Canaan, which is the the westbound of the map. So. They took the safer route to just follow the trails of Euphrates River and go all the way up to Haran. So Haran is not actually close to Canaan. When you look at it, it's actually up north here. Rather than going to the west to east, no, sorry, east to west, they just took north instead. instead of, but still, they are going towards the westbound, right? So well, let's take a look at uh, a few things here first of all so who is Terah Terah is the father of Abraham and when he was at 70 and he started to have Abraham Nahor and Haran so obviously he um, had three sons when he was at Uru so they were all born here and then he moved up north to Haran then who is the the oldest one if Abraham is not the oldest one then who is the oldest one Nahor no most likely Haran might be the uh, oldest one yeah the reason the reason the Haran might be the uh, oldest one is because when you look at this verse 29 
it gives us a clue. Abram and Nahor both married. So they both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. So the Nahor's wife was Milcah, and she was the daughter of Haran. So which means he got married. Milcah is the daughters of Haran, which means Haran is much older than both of them. Does that make sense? Because Milka is the one, uh, the daughters of Haran, and got married to the Milka. I mean, the Nahor, right? They're like, sort of, yeah, it's married with uncle, sort of. So, Haran seems to be the oldest one. And he died uh, before he came out of Uru. And the Bible really doesn't tell us what happened in Haran. I mean, not Haran, the Uru. But uh, let me just stop sharing for a moment. Okay. So, although the Bible doesn't really tell tell us what happened, but it seems like the Tara used to be the uh, he was uh, selling the idols to the people and it gives us a little clue when you look at Joshua I want you to turn to Joshua chapter 24 When you look at Joshua chapter 24, verse 2, and on, Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago your forefather, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, lived beyond the river and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham and from the land beyond the river and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac. So he gives us a little clue what happened. Right? And then when you look at um, Yeah, so it seems like Terah and Nahor both worshipped um, the idols. So I want you to think about this for a moment. So Terah and Nahor, both of them are idol worshipper. And it seems like Terah was selling the idols. Then how did Abraham get to know God? As he was growing up, all he saw was idols, and his parents were selling the idols, and they were worshiping the idol. But somehow, Abraham was not worshiping the idol. But I'm sure when he was young, I'm sure he worshiped the idols as well. Right? Because that's what he saw when he was, you know, early age. But there is a little story that we we can see possibly. Um, is um, uh, in the Bible that we read, right? This is what we call the canon. Canon is basically the books that we read. But outside the canon, there's uh, some other books. Uh, C-A-N-O-N. Uh, uh, canon. I'm sorry, not canon. There's other books in the Bible. 
So, have you ever heard of uh, a word Tanaka? Yeah, Tanaka. Yeah, so let me just show you something here. Uh, Yeah, that's how it ends, actually. I'm going to share my screen. Do you see my screen? Okay, so, oops. So, this, it, Tanakh. So, this is the, actually, Jewish Bible. Tanakh is actually came from this is um, the uh, what you call the uh, this is Torah this is how you read Torah and this Nabim and third Ketubim so remember I mentioned about uh, the Bible and the uh, Bibles of Jewish people a while back. So, Torah, Nevim, and Ketubim, those are three books. So, Torah means teaching. Nevim means prophets. And Ketubim means writings. So, it took the first alphabet from Torah Nevim and Ketubims. That's how you see here. Tanakh. So, this is actually, when you look at the, the right side of uh, the screens, you'll see the Jewish Old Testament, and this is Christian Old Testaments. We know we have 39 books in Old Testaments. Jewish does not have a 39 books, but they have a 24 books. So we'll show you the comparison between what's what's in there and what's not. So when you look at the Torah, it perfectly matches 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? And Joshua, Judge, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, King, and 2 King. But what you don't see is Ruth is not there because this Ruth is actually bundled in Judges. So we separate Judges and Ruth separately, but it's this one's both books are bundled into Judges. So instead of separating, they just bundled it. And we have First Kings, Second Kings, and First Chronicle and Second Chronicle. They don't have this, uh, you know, this First King, Second King, First King, and Second Chronicle. So they bundle First King and First Chronicle and Second King and Second Chronicle all together. As they made it with First King and Second King. So four books became two books. So, the way we are separating, where we are actually, you know, categorizing the Old Testament is a little different from Jewish, the Christian. So, this is the uh, comparison. So, I'm just kind of showing you what's in there, what's not there. And how is it different from Christian Old Testament versus Jewish Old Testament. So, Tanakh is basically Bibles of Jewish. So, out of here, this we called uh, canon. So, when you look at the canon, uh, I'm not sure. Um, there's, I don't know if you ever have ever heard of uh, uh, Apocrypha. Have you ever heard of uh, the term Apocrypha? So, the Apocrypha is not in the normal can, uh, the, the canon. It's actually outside the canon. So this, we don't include it in our Bible. But the Catholic Church, they include this into their Bible. So Catholic Church and Protestant Church, the Bible is different. So Catholic Church includes 39 books of uh, Old Testament plus all this 15 books here on the left side. So Tobits and Judith and editions of the Book of Aster, the Wisdom of Solomon's, 
Ecclesiastes, uh, or the wisdom of Joshua ben Sira, the Baruch, uh, the, letter, the letter of Jeremiah, the additions to the book of Daniel, the prayer of uh, um, Azariah, and the song of three Jews, and Susanna, and Bel, and the dragon, and first uh, Maccabees, and second Maccabees. These, the books on the left side, which is the 15 books, I mean 13 books actually, uh, is included in the uh, the normal Bible canon. But we don't call it canon. This is called, we, we call it apocrypha. Apocrypha means um, it is not included in our normal Bible. The reason is it hasn't been really confirmed whether this is supposed to be the true Bible canon or not. The difference between the Protestant and Catholic is, this is all came from, I don't know if you ever heard of Alexandria version of the Bible or the uh, Septuagint. Have you ever heard of the Septuagint Bible? Septuagint. Sep Septuagint means... Um, at the time of this Bible was written, um, the, ki the, the king of Ale Alexander uh, conquered uh, the land of uh, Persia. And then wherever he went, he preached about the Hellenism. Therefore, everybody wanted to learn the the Greek word and uh, philosophy and all the Hellenism that Alexander was uh, preaching. So what happened was people started to using Greek language rather than their own language, including all the Hebrews. Mm -hmm. So just like you guys, the second generation and third generation of the people started using Greek instead of using Hebrews. So they start to forget the Hebrews because they don't learn anymore. So they could only speak Greeks now. So people can't read the Bible anymore because it's, the Bible was written in Hebrews, not in Greeks. So elders got together and said, what can we do? You know what? Let's just translate this Hebrew into Greek word. So what they did was they picked six people from each tribe. And they picked six people from each tribe of 12. So how many people? Oh. So since they picked the six people from each tribe, and there are 12 tribes, it makes 72. People are gathered. They are scholar. And they are mastered in the scripture. So they started to translate the Hebrews into Greek version. And where they did, they did it in the, the, the city of Alexandria. The Alexandria is in Egypt. So they started to have those conversions. And then now finally, the Greek version of the, the Bible came about. That Alexandria is called Septuagint. Septuagint means 70 in Greek. Although it's a 72 people are there to translate, they usually call 70. So that's why they call the Septuagint or Alexandria version of the Bible. And this particular version of the Bible is converted in Greek. So when they converted it, what they did was they included this 15 books of Epicropa, uh, Kripa books in their canon. 
So, when Jesus Christ came, they were using the Septuagint as the Bible at the time. So these books were included in the in their Bible. But it's not included in ours. So let me see if I can actually change this. Hang on one second. Stop sharing and then sharing again. I don't know if you can see. You see this? Uh, spreadsheet okay so I kind of created this uh, spreadsheet that shows the Bible and Old Testament and this this prote uh, the Protestants and Roman Catholic Church so oops, I should have this so the canon of a scripture a Protestant has a 39 books of Old Testament but Roman Catholic has a 51 books and Epicrypa we actually have a 15 books outside of our normal canon but they got three books they categorize as as Epicrypa the Catholic Church is still uh, Roman Catholics still consider this Epicrypa as part of their normal canon. They they consider we although we don't consider. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get to that in the you know next slide. So there are three books they call it as Epicrypa. Uh, this is first Est, uh, Esdras and second Esdra, the prayer of Manasseh. Those three books they call it as Epicrypa. The rest of it they all included in the canon. Of course, the New Testament is exactly the same thing in both, um, in, you know, the, the Roman Catholic and, and Protestant. So for us, the Protestants, we have a 66 books as the Bible or the canon. However, the Roman Catholic Church consider 78 books instead of a 66 books so their their Bible is much thicker than us so here's the kind of the you know very simple history of how the book uh, came about so the Hebrew Old Testaments um, the Pentateuch obviously is what Book of Moses, right? Genesis through the Deuteronomy. So this book was uh, was completed in BC 50s, and prophets, which is what we call as Ketubims, was actually completed in BC 200, and other books, not not Pentateuch or uh, prophets, but you know. Uh, I'm sorry, Nabim, the prophet is Nabim, and Ketubim was completed in about B.C. 100. And then, during the time of, um, you know, all the early Christians were gathered and they started to formulate the Bible. And then Jewish people, you know, started to think, you know what, we have to finalize our canon as well. So they had a council of Yamnia, in eighteen nineties they finalized the thirty nine books of the Bibles that we know. Yeah, in Old Testaments. This is when where they finalize, you know, we only consider these are the true true Old Testament in eighteen nineties. And New Testament, those twenty seven books that we know, was a finalized uh, you know, it was almost completed around eighty one hundred. And um, year 387 at the Council of uh, uh, Carthage, they actually had a meeting and they finalized only 27 books are the final version of the New Testaments. That's how we know the 39 and 27 books, which becomes a 66 books of the entire Bible, is a final version. Okay? Yes, because there was all there was a several, you know, um, you know, uh, controversy uh, whether we should include, like for example, Hebrews, 
like um, an Ephesians or like um, um, uh, Revelations. Those books were all, you know, they were um, arguing each other whether to include it in the, uh, the canon or not. So the later on, they finalized, this is it. You know, this is, we truly confirm this is, you know, that in a, legit, a legitimate, um, the Bible. So it took a little time for them to, to finalize this. All right, so go back to here. So this is what we called Epicrypha. And then besides this Epicrypha, oh, hang on. So you're still looking at the other screen. So what screen are you looking at right now? The spreadsheet, right? So let me share. Okay, let me. Okay, come back here. All right. You see it? You see my PowerPoint? Okay. And the next. Whoa. So this is a whole lot. This is another sort of the books uh, you might want to know. Uh, it's called I don't see the change all right so let me stop it again oh all right let me try it again all right so it's a full list of uh, stuff it's called uh, Zudapigrippa. Uh, Zudapigrippa. This is another kinds of the, you know, it's not Bible. It's not a canon, but it's just, it's just a, a different books that we don't consider as. So, for example, Apocrypha is just like we consider to be like useful reference, but. Zudapi Griffa is not considered as any valuable information. But there are lots of books. The Epicalpsy of Abraham, Book of Adam and Eve, and Epicalps of Adams and Syriac, Epicalpsy of Baruch. And these books we don't consider as a valuable or that consider as a canon at all. Right? But people do read these books. The reason that I actually bring all this is because uh, I wanted to actually now focus on this book. Oops. This book. You see this book of Jubilees? I don't know if you see my uh, cursor. You see my cursor? Yes? No? Right here. Right here. The, yeah, it's the same page, but when you look towards down, you see the uh, one, two, three, four, the, the last, the, the bold, uh, the book, the book of Jubilees. You see that book from the bottom? Yeah, the, like bottom portions. All right, you see that? Okay, so the Book of Jubilees is what I want to talk about. That's why I actually talked about uh, Epigrippa and uh, Sudapigrippa and all that books. So these books are not really considered to be the canon at all, but when you look at the Book of Jubilees, is basically it talks about, it's called the Lesser Genesis. This is um, another titles of a book of Jubilee. So this book of Jubilee talks about, you know, the stories of um, the uh, the Genesis. So we talked talked about, you know, the, the much details of Adam and Eve's family, and it, it mentions about the Adam's daughters and and who was the um, how Adam died, why he lived the seven hundred thirty years. And I mean not seven hundred nine hundred thirty years, and how uh the uh Cain died, like for example, he died because of the uh 
uh, house fell and the rock actually came upon him and then he just kind of like died there and he was pressed by the stones because he actually stoned his brother Abel that kind of stories in there he talked about Nephilim which we talked about that you know he was the uh, you know the the fallen angels versus uh, you know the man the woman got married and then they had a giant Nephilim so stories more details in there you know there are a lot of uh, stories that we don't see in the Genesis is also in this book the book of Jubilees and in there what you see is is this I'm going to show you this in a moment. Let me just stop this, and then share another book. Uh, oh, you know, I'm going back and forth. Wait a second. Hang on. Not this. Share my screen. Uh, okay, here. All right. Do you see? my screen yes no you see it all right so read mode okay good this is the part of the this is I uh, parse the uh, the the sections of the book of Jubilees all right so it was a out of multiple chapters I just parsed the chapter 12 here so let's just you know skim through some of the sec uh, stuff in here so when you look at here the Abram Ev seeks to run Terra from idolatry and marries a Sarai the Haran and Nahor and Abram burned the idol the death of Haran then Terah's family go to Haran and Abram observed the stars and praise and uh, bidden to go to Canaan and blessed and power of speaking Hebrew given to him and leaves uh, the Haran to Canaan so out of that this is basically very simple sections of it. So it's, this is, talks about the verse. So we're going to talk about the first one. And it came to, pa uh, came to pass in the sixth week, the seventh years thereof, that Abraham said to Terah, his father, saying, Father. And he said, Behold, here, I, you know, here am I, my son. And he said, What help and profit have we from those idols which thou post a dosed worship? And before which thou dost uh, bow, bow thyself, for there is no spirit in them, for they are a dumb form and misleading of the heart, and worship them not, that worship the God of heaven, who caused the rain and dew to descend on the earth, and those, uh, does everything upon the earth, and he created everything by his word, and all life is from before his face. Why do ye, uh, why do ye, worship things that have no spirit in them for they are the work of hands and on their uh, shoulders do do ye bear them and you have no help from them but they are a great cause of a shame to those who make them and a misleading of a heart to those who worship them worship them not and his father said unto him i also know know it my son but what shall i do with the people who have made me to serve before them and if i tell them the truth that they will slay me for their soul you know cleaves to them to worship them and honor them and keep silent my son lest my slay be and these words he speak us a speck to his two brothers and they were angry with them and he kept silence and in the four, uh, forties of Jubilee in the second week the seventh year thereof the Abraham took to himself a wife and her name was Sarai daughter of his, uh, his father and became his wife and the story goes on and on so as you can see here there are stories that we don't see in our normal Bible which is in our canon so there are more much more detailed story is in this book so what this story goes is that the Terah and all his other brother, which is Nahor and uh, Haran, was the worshippers of idols. However, the Abram was not. He was going against it because one day what happened was there was, you know, his father and his brother uh, went on a trip to sell the idols. And his Terah told his son, Abram, and he said, Son, please keep these idols you know safe while I'm away and then we'll come back after the, this trip is over 
And then there was the there was a different size of idols. Yeah, there was like but there was like a big idol in the center, then a smaller idols in other places. So what he did was what he did was while they were away, so he um broke all the idols. He's cut off all the heads of the idols. And then he left the big idol's head in the center and and then he cut every other idol's head off. So when his father and brother came back from their trip selling the idols, and then father saw that all the idol was head was all cut off, and he ran to his you know son Abraham and he said, "Son, what happened? I told you to keep all this in, you know, the safety." And he goes like, "The Abraham goes like, oh, dead. By the way, I've saw amazing things. So what did you see? What happened here?" And he said. The idol that, that the biggest idol in the center over there that you see, it just like after you left, he just stood up and then he started to go around and cut off all the heads of the idols. And his father said, uh, Father Tara says, what are you talking about? This is a stone. How could stone could walk around and cut off the, their head off? And Abraham said, dead. You see, this stone does not have a life in it. It cannot move around. Why do you make this and why do you sell this and why do you worship this? So that's how the story goes. And then later on, he burned them all. And while he was burning all this, uh, the idols, what happened was during the fire, the, his, the uh, oldest brother, Haran, was burned and died in Uru. So that's why the Uru, uh, the Haran was dead before they left the Chardians, the land of Uru, which we don't see anywhere in our Bible. This is all in this, the book of Jubilee. All right, so, I mean, we're not here to read all this. Uh, uh, so that be graphy story but you know i'm just want to kind of like explain to you you know how of course this is not all you know consider as the bible but there are certain things that we know there are some other stories to this does that make sense so anyway huh? oh we don't consider this, like I said, we don't consider this as true canon, but there are useful, there are useful information in this book. It is not completely, you know, useless. There are certain portions, although we don't consider it as a canon, uh, yeah, there might be some other story. So we can see other things outside the Bible. Whether this, do we actually consider this as the part of the Bible? No, we don't. But we're just knowing there was other side of the so story on this. So rather than, yeah, they worshiped the idols. And then we know, oh, they were selling the idols. They were worshiping the idols in a little more details. Although we don't consider this as a true canon. Okay? It's just a reference, not as our normal uh you know, canon. So, uh, I just talked about Haran seems to be the oldest one instead of Abram. So, uh, Terah, his, Abram's father, died uh, when he was in Haran, and he died at 205 years old when he died. So after his father died, and then he left the Haran, and then he traveled down to uh, the Canaan. So go to chapter 12 now. It said, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. 
and I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, uh, I will curse, and all people on earth and will be blessed through you. So Abraham left, as the Lord had told him. The lot went with him. Abraham was a 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of uh, Moreh at Shechem, at that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord uh, appeared to Ab Ab Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord he, who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel, uh, Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abraham set out and continued towards the Negev. Now, so Abraham heard the voice of God and say, said, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. And then God promised, I will make you into a great nation, I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. So, once again, as I mentioned, Abraham did not know much about God, because he was a grown up in the family who worshipped the idols. So his ideas or or, or a knowledge of God was very limited, but. He heard the voice of God and telling him to, you know, go to the promised lands. So I want you to think about it from this perspective. Like, I want you to put yourself in his shoes. He doesn't know who this, who this God is, but he heard a voice and, and telling him to go to a place where he has never been. How would you feel? Would you have a courage to just go because you heard something? Or you would have like very hesitant, you know, you know, hesitant about like whether I should go or should I not go? Like how would you feel? Right? You'll be very hesitant, right? Then I'm sure he was as well. Like for example, you know, if God appeared in your dreams or he, you, know, he, you heard his voice and say, Hey, I want you to go to a land that you never even heard of and pack it up today and leave tomorrow. And obviously you're not going to pack it up and leave tomorrow because you have no idea where you're going. And he was probably in the same situations. I'm sure he was very hesitant. But he decided to move to a place where God told him to go. So when he moved, when he decided to move to a promised land or the promise that, you know, the land that God, um, you know, told him to go, what would you expect when you go there? What would be your expectation? You, you, you would not have any expectation whatsoever? I mean, since God appeared to you and then said, you know, I want you to go to a place where I direct you. So then, Well, let's just, uh, you know, simplify this. So, would you expect something good over there or would you expect something bad over there? Hmm? 
you would expect something good. You would expect something bad. <laughs> you know, God appeared to him. So, obviously, Abraham does not know who this God is. Right? He doesn't know much about this God. You know, in ancient days, they worshipped many gods. So, how would he know which God is he speaking to? Right? It's different from today. In the ancient day, they worship anything, sort of. There are many gods there. And he does know who this God is. So when he left that place, I'm sure he expected something good rather than something bad. So he decided to move to the place where God is directing, directing him to go. So he traveled. So he traveled... It said, when you look at the verse 2, it said, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. So when you hear the God saying, I will bless you, then you would expect what? Something to be blessed, and when I get there, I will be blessed, and it will be, everything will be okay, because God is blessing me. Right? This verse that we're reading, verse 2, is very important for us to understand the rest of the Genesis. So, Abram heard the blessing from God that I will bless you and I will make you a great nation. So he took it upon himself and said, okay, God is promising me that he's going to give me the blessing. So now the question here is, we have to define what is blessing? What is blessing to you? When you hear the word blessing, what is blessing to you? Hmm? You know, in Koreans, usually say at the, at the beginning of the year, said, you know, and I want you to have a blessing this year, right? So when someone wishing you a bless, then what do you expect when you hear that word? I want you to have a lot of blessing this year. It's like, what do you expect? What are you thinking of when you hear that word, blessing? A lot of blessing. Benefit, like what kind of benefit? Well, obviously, let you know. Let's just you know talk about what we normally consider as blessings. What is good? You know, it's probably you know uh, being being you know comfortable. You know, making more money, right? Good health. You know, no trouble in our family, you know, just happy life, right? Abundant food, right? Those are what we consider as blessings, right? So, is that the blessing that God is talking about then? Then what is the blessing that God is talking about then? You will be the blessing what is blessing? So we, we have to know. We have to define what blessing. Because the blessing, the word blessing is a very common word in the Bible. Right, especially in Gen especially in Genesis, you know there are a lot of word blessing. So, what is blessings? Gift. 
So let let's go back to you know, you know, previous example that I mentioned. Whenever I'm heard that God promising him that I will give you blessings, what do you think he was thinking at the time when he was hearing this? What would he actually expect? Obviously, we don't know, but we're just—it's all you know, guess. Obviously. I'm sure, you know, a lot of food will be there, right? As pleasant life will be there is probably what he was expecting, right? And then, verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all people on earth will be blessed through you. So this is the word you have to pay attention. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. You are blessed, and all the people on earth will be blessed through you. Then what is this? Can you think of anything? All right, let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to read from verse 1. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suf uh, suffered so much for nothing? If it, if it really was for nothing, does God give you his spirit and work miracle among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard? Consider Abraham. He believed God. It was credited to him as a righteousness. Understand then that those believed are children of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who have a faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentile through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Now, can you guess? No? Not sure? Obviously, the blessing that God is talking about is not clearly is not the treasure, not the health, 
It's not the abundant food for sure, right? So this particular chapter in Galatians talks about what? The faith of Abraham. And we are blessed through him. And verse 14 specifically said, He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentile through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Then what is it? So how do we receive the Spirit? Believe what? That Jesus Christ is our Savior. And as a return, as a result, we receive the Holy Spirit. Right? So the Holy Spirit, what is the work of the Holy Spirit? What does Holy Spirit do? What does the Holy Spirit do? The Word. Okay. So what does the Holy Spirit do then? Holy Spirit reveals that Jesus Christ is the Savior. He reveals that Jesus Christ. Without the Holy Spirit, we will never know who Jesus Christ is. Holy Spirit is the one who reminds us and reveal that Jesus Christ is the Savior. So what is the blessing then? Continue on, verse 15. Brothers, let me take an example from everyday life, just as no one can set aside or add to a human um, covenant that has been duly established. So it is in this case, the promise were spoken to Abraham and said to he, uh and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. The blessing is Christ. The blessing is Christ. So, the God is saying to Abraham that I will bless you, and through, through you, I will make you into a great nation. And he promised, and all the people will be blessed through you. Through whom? Through whom? Through Jesus Christ. Not through Abraham. But descendants of Abraham, the Jesus Christ, he will be the blessings to all the nations of the people. But did Abraham knew this? Did he know? Obviously, did he did not know. He did not know. He did not know anything about Jesus Christ. He's, he most likely expected some... You know, wealthy blessing is what he was probably expecting. Or abundant food is probably what he was expecting. But what God promised him was not that. That was not the blessing that he promised to Abraham. That promise was revealed in New Testament. That blessing was Jesus Christ. So then, when you believe in Jesus Christ, what happened to you? You get to live, you, you get to live, you know, you get to live pleasant life? No? What happened? And when, you're, when, when you believe in Jesus Christ, what happened to those people who believe in Jesus Christ? Live a happy life? What kind of life? Will you be living 
according to the scriptures. Hmm? Suffering. Hard alive. Exactly. People will hate you. People will persecute you. You will live hard life. You are living very happy life until Jesus Christ believed. But soon after you believe in Jesus Christ, everyone will hate you. They will hate you. And I'm, I'm, I'm warning you. Everyone will hate you. Everyone will come after you. They will persecute you. And I, I'm telling you this before this happened. That's what Jesus said. Obviously, Abraham was not expecting that at all. So when you look at, come back to the Genesis, verse 10, Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. All right. So God told him, I will bless you. So he moved on from good place. Remember, Uru was Chardians. That's where civilization started. That's where the abundant foods are. He was living good life. But God pulled him out of there and moved to Canaan. And when he reached there, what did he find? Famine. Is that just normal famine? It's pretty bad famine, is it? And when he reached there, what would he actually say to God? Although it doesn't say in the Bible. <laughs> I'm sure he was probably cursing. <laughs> right? He was not happy. Because when he got there, it was a severe famine, which means there are, there is no food for his family. There are no food for for his, you know, uh the animals. He was not happy at all. So then, what did he what did he have to do? He could not stay there. He had to move on, right? He had to go to find food. But was that the place where God told him to go? Obviously not. He moved on to Egypt. Why did he move to Egypt? Why did he go to Egypt? Hmm? You don't know? Well, obviously, when you look at it, right, where are the good food? Where there is river, right? Euphrates River. And there are a lot of food because of the river. And it was too far for him to go back. Right? So where did he go? Somewhere close, and there is river. Where? Egypt, what's there? River of what? 
Nile. Right? It is the closest place. So that's why he moved down to Egypt to find food. But obviously, Egypt was not the place where he wanted to go. But he, the God never told him to move to Egypt. If the food was a blessing, the God should have told him to go to Egypt instead of going to Canaan. And God, God already knew there's a famine, there's severe famine in, Can in Canaan. And he told him to go there. It was a God's intention to put him to difficulty and hardship. Think about it. If God told him and it said, I will bless you. By the way, when you get there, you're going to find the severe fame, uh, the famine. Do you think he's going to move? I don't think so. I don't think he would, he would have moved from where he was to the promised land. If God told him that when you get there, you're going to find the famine and you're going you're gonna to live a very difficult life. There's no reason for him to move. God did not say, well, when you get there, there's going to be a lot of food. But God did say, I will bless you. But when you get there, there was a severe famine. Now, I want you to think about it. God said, he will bless you. And your life is not going well. What would you think? Do you think this is a blessing? Or do you think it was a curse? Do you think Abraham was thinking this was cursed or blessed? When he got to the land of Canaan, and I think... And if I were him, I would probably said, did I hear it wrong? Maybe he was telling me to go somewhere else? Or maybe he wasn't God. Maybe I was a dreaming. <laughs> exactly. You're not sure anymore. Because what you, what you see in the Bible is, God never said anything when he got there. Right? It's not like, oh, by the way, you know, Abraham, don't worry, I'll take care of you. God never appeared to him. Right? There's no mention in the Bible that God appeared to him at all when he reached the, the, the Canaan. So from his perspective, like, he, he's lost. He, right, exactly. And he might have heard it wrong. Maybe, maybe it was a nightmare. You know, I want you to put yourself in his shoes. What would you do and what would you think when you were in this situation? And you thought you clearly heard the God's voice and it said, go. And then you went there and all you find is a severe fam famine. What would you do and what would you think? <laughs> yeah, Most likely we will. Most likely we will. And Abraham was in the same boat. He was no different. He had to move because he had to feed his family. He had to feed his animals. If he stayed there, I'm going to die. So I got to do something here. And he moved down to Nile, which is the closest river where he can find find. So when you come back to chapter 12, verse 4, it says, So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. All right? Now, I want you to pay attention here. 
this verse 4 that I just read, what do you think you have to pay attention here? Yeah. I want you to think about what God said and what he did. What did he do? What did God say? Let's take a look at chapter 12, verse 1 again. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. And go back to chapter 12, verse 4. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, the lot went with him. Abram was a 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took Lot with him. What did God say? Leave your people, leave your father's household. Right? But he took Lot with him. Why? He needed a safeguard. He needed someone he can give his inheritance because he didn't have a child. He wanted to have a someone with him. That's why he took Lot with him. And then this is very important because this, and you will get to actually understand later on in chapter um, 13, you're going to understand what this means. But for now, Lot went, went with him. So he took the Lot with him. And then he moved down to Canaan. And he stayed there. And then God said to him, Verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offsprings, once again, a singular form, it's not a plural form, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east side of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Where did you see this one? This statement. We saw this somewhere in the past. Where did you see? We saw this in chapter 4, verse 26. What is that? Twenty six.
Genesis chapter 4 verse 26. Right. The last word was set and his descendant to call on the name of the Lord. Right? What did Abraham do when he reached there? What did he do? That's what he did in verse 8 in chapter 12. Right? And he called on the name of the Lord when he reached there. Right? So, on verse 8, From there he went on toward the hill east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west. So which side he stayed? Which side did he go? From there he went on toward the hill east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and I on the east. So which side he stayed? He stayed from the east of Bethel. Right? What does the Bethel mean, by the way? Do you know what Bethel means? Bethel means bait. Bait means house. L means God. So Bethel means house of God. It means house of God. But he stayed which side? East of Bethel. Right? So second time God appeared. First time before he set off and second time when he settled there that's where God appeared. And he promised that I will give you the offsprings. Right? When he appeared for the first time he said I will bless you and people will be blessed through you. And when he reached there he promised the offspring. What is that offspring? That's what we read in Galatians. What is that offspring? Hmm? Already forgot? We Let's go back to Galatians chapter 5 again. Yeah. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 16. What does it say? So what is this promise? When he reached, he, he reached at promised land, the Canaan, and he gave a promise. What was that? He said, I will give you to your offspring. I will give this land. And he says, the offspring is a seed. And what is that seed? Jesus Christ. That's the only promise he, the God gave it to him when he reached the the, uh, the promised land. He didn't say anything else. He said, to, off to, to your offspring. Right? I will give this land to you. That offspring was Jesus Christ. It was the only thing that God said. He didn't say anything else that was the only thing he said. 
And then he found there is a severe famine, so he moved down to south. In verse 11, as he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will set you uh, will let me uh, let you leave say you are my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you when Ab Abraham came to Egypt the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman and when Pharaoh's officials saw her they praised her to Pharaoh and she was taken into his uh, palace he he treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired a sheep and cattle and male and female donkeys and manservant and maidservant and camels. But the Lord inflicted a serious disease on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife Sarah. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? He said. Why, did, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take, take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave order about Abraham to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Now, God did not tell him to go to Egypt, but he decided to move to Egypt because he, need, he needed food to you know, feed his families and animals. And But when he was moving down to Egypt, he was afraid. said, you know, don't say anything to anybody. Just say you're my sister. Don't say you're my wife. Did he lie? Did he lie? Yes? He didn't lie. She is, is a sister. Exactly. He, yeah. He is a sister. Yeah, he just only told half the story. He didn't tell the full story. He didn't lie. <laughs> it was he. She was her her his sister. <laughs> But can you imagine, you know, let's let's say you get married, right? And then you go to a place and it's like, don't say anything because they may kill you. They may kill me. Don't say anything. And then he gave away his wife. And as 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 a you know, as a gift, he received a lot of animals and may servant and man servant and camels and and this and that. Right? try to save himself and what do we call Abraham as man of fate and and <laughs> <laughs> you know you know let's have agreements you you and me uh, you know have a separate life and you go on your life I go on my life so you know <laughs> <laughs> Which, what would you think? You know, you as a woman, your husband sold you for gift. <laughs> and we call him, you know, Abraham as a man of fate, the father of, you know, fate, right? Is it really? Do you actually see him that way through this story? Not really. So is that means he have a, he did, did he have a strong faith in God, or he was afraid? This incident clearly tells us that he didn't have a faith in God. That's why he moved. That's why he didn't say anything to anybody, and he sold his wife to Pharaoh. Because he was afraid. 
He was nothing more than a man like us. It's not like he had a strong fate at the beginning. He had a very little fate at the beginning. He wasn't sure. He was confused. Everything was all messed up when he reached the land of Canaan. Because n that was not what he was expected. So he was confused. Is this God going to protect me? Did I hear it right? Am I believing the right thing? Should I go back? He was confused. Wouldn't you be in, the, in that situation? I would. So there's nothing to blame him. But important thing is God made him to be the father of faith. The guy who had no faith, God made him to be the father of faith. He sold his wife. Yeah. It's a pitiful man. He didn't protect his wife. He just, he was busy, you know, trying to like save his life. That's all he cared about. Even if you go on and you become a wife of, uh, you know, the Pharaoh, you know, I'm okay. I'm still alive. If God did not, you know, intercede this, he would permanently lose his wife. Right? But God stopped it. That's how he got his wife back. Not because he, would, he did anything to bring his wife back. He didn't do anything. Right? He absolutely did nothing. He just sold his wife and that was it. <laughs> but God appeared to um, the Pharaoh and he sent a plague. Think about this story. Isn't that similar to the story of Exodus? There's a pharaoh, wife, and sent the plague, and they got together and they left the Egypt with a lot of treasure. Isn't that the same story? Then let's think about it. What is what about wife? What wife? Who's the wife? Exactly. Correct. That's the same story. It's a small scale, but it's the same story, isn't it? And later on, what did God say in chapter 15? Verse 13 and 14, he said, Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be stranger in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated four hundred years. But I will punish the nation they will serve as slave, and afterward they will come out with great possession. Isn't that exactly what he did? Right? Jacob was living in Canaan. Later, they all moved down to. There was a severe famine, right? They moved down to Egypt. 
right? And they served as a slavery. And then God pulled them out of Egypt with abundant treasure. It's the same exact story, isn't it? Now, chapter 13, it says, So Abram went up from Egypt to Negev with his wife, and everything he had and Lot went with them. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and the silver and gold from Negev. He went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where he tent had been earlier when he had first built an altar. There Abraham called on the name of the Lord. So they came back to where? Bethel. So they came back to promised land, Canaan. Then the Israelites came back to Canaan. When Jacob left Canaan and he came back to Canaan. It's the same story. We just don't see it that way. Yeah. And then, continue on. Here's the things. God did not say anything to Abram. God did not rebuke him and say, why did you go down? Right? God didn't say anything to him. He just kept quiet. And he came back to Bethel and he called on the name of the Lord. And chapter 13, verse 5, Lot, who was moving about with Abraham, also had flocks and herd and the tent. And the land could not support them while they stayed together. For their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abraham's herdmen and uh, herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and Peretzites were also living in the land at that time. So Abraham said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your Herd man and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I will go to the right. If you go to the right, I will go to the left. Lot looked up, saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt toward Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed the Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself and whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted a company. Abraham lived in the land of Canaan while Lot lived among the city of the plain and pitched his tent near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. The Lord said to Abraham after Lot had parted from him, Lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south, east and west. All the land that you see, I will give you your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the, uh, the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abraham moved his tent and went to live near the great tree of Mamre and Baron, where he built an altar to the Lord. So, this is the third time that God appeared to uh, the Abraham. Right? So, both Abraham and Lot, they grew big. And they, you know, he's heard man started to having a fight each other because of the, the grass for their, their animals. And then since they started to having a lot of quarrelings and fighting between uh, their servants, so Abraham reached out to Lot and said, why should we fight here? You and me, there's a family here, so let's depart f 
from each other, and when you go to the left, I go to the right. So Lot looked at it and said, whoa, that land is good. And he moved towards the east. Remember when we were studying about Genesis chapter uh, 2, uh, uh, chapter 3, when the woman looked at the tree of knowledge, right? When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes and desire for gaining wisdom, of obviously, she saw that the tree of knowledge before. But when the serpent said, well, you eat of this, you will, you will surely not die. And then when she looked again, it looked good and pleasing to the eyes. Same thing. Lot, I'm sure he looked at the Camorra before. But when Abram said, let's depart, and he looked again, that land of east that seemed good for him, pleasing to these eyes. So he moved towards the east. Eastbound is what? The direction of a sins away from God. Right? So he moved towards the east. Then obviously, which direction did Abraham move to? The west. Right? And then, importantly, verse 14 is what I was talking about before. I'm going to read verse 14 again. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot left, parted from him. So, what does this tell you? Correct. Because that's what God told him at the beginning. Leave your family behind. Just you and your family go. Not others. But he brought Lot with him. As a safeguard. But God forced him. To depart from Lot. So God waited until they separate. So then, think about this. God told Abraham to go to the promised land, the Canaan. I'm going to show you where you, you need to go. But he moved down to Egypt. Not by God's will, but his will. But now, I want you to think about this. Did God know that he's going to move down to Egypt? Or he didn't know that he was going to go to Egypt. He knew. Then the question is, was it part of his plan? Yes, it was a part of his plan. That's why he sent the severe famine. Once again, Right? Exactly. So God already knew that he's going to move down. So he used the severe famine. So he could not stay there. So he moved down to Egypt. But it's all part of his plan. So he sold his wife and he earned all this wealth from Pharaoh. And when he came back to Bethel, he was already rich. He received so much gift from Pharaoh. He was so rich. Lot was rich. So they started to have a fight each other. So they have to depart from each other. God did not tell him where to go. Abraham said, if you go east, I'll go to west. If you go to west, I go to east. If you go to north, I go to e south. And when you go to south, I'm going to go to north. But when Lot decided to move, he chose to go to east. And then he, Abraham, therefore, he moved to west. And now, after Lot had departed from him, 
And now God is giving him the blessing. Lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south and east and west. All the land that you see I will give you and your offspring forever. Once again. Your offspring forever. I will make you or offspring like the dust of the earth. So if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. Giving it what? What is this promise? This promise is what we just read again in Galatians chapter 3. What is it? It's Jesus. Right? So Abraham moved his tent and went to live near the great tree of Mamre and Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. So all this promise is all going back to what it says in the Galatians. By the way, the story that you read in Genesis, by the way, this was about the promise of Jesus Christ. The explanation is all the way in the back instead of here. It doesn't mention anything about Jesus Christ in Genesis at all. It explains later on in Galatians. This promise, this blessing was Jesus Christ. Once again, when we read the Bible, we're not trying to find Abraham. We're not trying to find a lot. We're not trying to find anyone else but Jesus. The story, the story of the Bible is about Jesus, who he is, what he will do, how he will save us, and who we are. It's the same story over again. What we used to see was Abraham. Oh, let's just learn the fate of Abraham. Listen, there's nothing to learn from Abraham. Abraham was just one of the examples that God gave to explain about his plan of a salvation. Does that make sense? Exactly. He happened to be the examples that we, you know, God is giving. God is not trying to just tell us the history or trying to explain how great Abraham was and then for us to follow the fate of Abraham. No, that's not that. But that's how we learn the Bible. Stories. Israel story because that's why many people talk about why do you why are you learning the Israel's history? I'm not trying to learn Israel's history. That's not what God is trying to teach me. Anyway, so that's the story of um, this chapter twelve and thirteen. In chapter fourteen, it's gonna it's gonna come much clearer what I'm just talking about. Any questions up to this sections that we talked about today? <laughs>